Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know there's a lot of uh, competing things going on, but we appreciate you being here with us tonight. My name is Dennis LeCarrie. I'm the senior assistant to the county manager, and I've got oversight for the redevelopment of Brooklyn Village. And tonight's topic is focus on economic opportunity and the approach to retail in the development. With us this evening, we've got uh, Don Peebles, who's the chairman and president of the Peebles Corporation, Monty Ritchie, who's the president of Conformity Corporation, Jeffrey Simon from Stantec, and possibly a few others as the evening rolls on. We do have a presentation. I think we'll probably uh, be a little more informal tonight given the number of attendees. This presentation will also be uh, presented tomorrow. So we will have a second meeting here tomorrow afternoon if you uh, want to engage in both meetings. Same topic, same presentation, but everybody is welcome to both. And with that, I will turn it over. So not that we need this. You know, it's good to be back in Charlotte. And, um, you know, I'm very happy to be here uh, to continue to discuss the exciting project that we have planned for Brooklyn Village. And but before I do that, I think it's important, you know, look, I'm, I'm in New York City and Florida and Washington, D.C. And so about two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, um, we completed uh, in Washington, D.C., the annual legislative uh, conference for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, I happen to chair that organization, and so we had the opportunity that evening to speak, to hear, I, uh, hear from our president and also the Democratic nominee for president, Hillary Clinton. I also got a chance to speak earlier. And the topic of my remarks that evening was about the disparity um, that confronts our country. And that's a disparity between African Americans and the rest of the country. And, uh, and that's an undeniable disparity, and it cuts across the board. It cuts across the board educationally, home ownership, economically, career opportunity, um, and also our respective experiences in terms of law enforcement. You know, clearly our young people also want um, to know that the police are going to serve and protect them as well as they're going to do with everybody else here and everybody else in the community. And so, um, you know, when I w as I've been uh, engaged in these discussions in the community in Charlotte, um, one of the things that has struck me is that we as a community do have to do a considerably better job in terms of economic opportunity because as we've gone around and had these discussions, one of the things that we have heard and let, I keep hearing from uh, African American entrepreneurs is a challenge to access to capital. By the way, I have not heard it from anybody else. I mean, no other constituency, no other group of entrepreneurs has expressed any kind of impediment to getting access to capital. Now, everybody that I see as a minority business person expresses that challenge. Not just, by the way, in Charlotte, but around the country. But here, the second largest banking center in the United States, it struck me as odd. So I, about the last um, time we had meetings in this very room, I left here and I went to meet with the um, team over at the, is it the Charlotte? Charlotte Center City Partners. Charlotte Center City Partners. And I told the president there that I was struck by this and that I did not think that it was sustainable. And little did I know that we would be, the rest of the country would be watching Charlotte, watching a part of where this project will be built and seeing the frustration. And unfortunately, uh, the, the disorder um, and disorderly conduct of some members who are participating in that process. But I think that we all understand that there is a growing level of frustration um, for those in my generation, me at 56, um, those of the generation that's younger than me in their 40s, and then, of course, our young people, millennials, who don't have the rear view that I have. I was born in 1960, so I see the great progress that our communities and our country have made. My son, who's 22, thinks that we're way behind because he doesn't have that rear view mirror to know and been alive when the 1968 riots took place, been alive to, um, when school busing was forced because we had completely segregated public school systems around the country. So today, though, as we fast forward, I think the biggest impediment um, is economic opportunity. 
And so part of why from day one that we got involved in this project from the beginning was because of the historical aspect of taking a community that was a thriving African-American community that was destroyed as for the benefit of urban renewal, um, and then the communities that were prospering in that, na that neighborhood in Brooklyn Village were dispersed and never brought back. And so we felt, and I felt, Mon Monty and our team, was that we would rebuild Brooklyn Village in a different way and bring it to what the current issues are. And the current issue, the way we honor those who lost so much in the past, was to give them what their ultimate goal was, which was equal access to opportunity. So I think we stood alone and stand alone in Charlotte to committing to 35 percent minority and women-owned business economic opportunity. And that's what people are fighting for. And so we think that as a partnership with the county, that the county, Conformity, Peebles, Stantec, and the rest of us, we are setting a new trend, setting a new standard, because we're hearing the, the lack of opportunity. And so on top of it all, because the county um, and because Dennis and his team uh, wanted to get the message out about this opportunity, we've been engaging in these community meetings. Um, and the goal is to express our seriousness of the economic opportunities that are associated with the project and, um, and, and making sure everyone is aware of the opportunities here because this is going to be a very different Charlotte project. We mean what we say. There will be transformative economic opportunities on our site. And we hope that we are now changing the marketplace and so that everybody with all these cranes that we see here also recognizes the diversity of the city that they're doing business in and that the economic opportunities should be more reflective of the demographics of the community that's been so kind to all of these businesses to create an economic environment that's conducive to building these buildings and having this great progress. And so we hope to raise the bar. We hope everybody here, everybody who's heard us before, everybody who's watching this being streamed hears us and holds others to the standard that there needs to be greater economic parity. And so I just wanted to touch on that because it's the issue of the moment. It's one of the top issues um, in our country. That's what people were talking about is Charlotte. What's going on in Charlotte? Did you hear what's going on in Charlotte? And, uh, and we have a different experience of Charlotte, but we understand the frustration. And, uh, and so we're going to do our part as business people to create opportunities and have an immensely successful project in the process economically and be transformative. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about who we are. I think by now many people know conformity. They know the People's Corporation. So our company, the People's Corporation, I started it in 1983 in Washington, D.C., an environment that was very conducive for aspiring African-American entrepreneurs to where in 1979 that city committed to 35% minority contracting on all city contracts in 1979. So here we are now in 2016 and 35% somehow is transformative still. Um, so, but we started there, built our first building um, to restore a economically neglected area that was destroyed by the riots and overlooked by urban renewal. And the goal was to create economic opportunity in a community very similar to what Brooklyn Village was um, to restore economic opportunity to a community that was in desperate need of it and to be transformative. And so that building we built, we owned half of it, so it was 50 percent minority owned. It was built with minority subcontractors, and it was to this day created opportunities for minority retailers and small businesses. And so we have retailers that were brand new businesses, two of them. They are still in business today. The building opened in 89, so what's the mass? They're 25, 26 years later. They're still in business. They've thrived. They've gone on to do other things, including the janitorial services business that we started um, or allowed them to have their first opportunity, and they expanded citywide as well. We went on from that one building to, uh, to own and develop several million square feet in downtown Washington, D.C., and then expanded into South Florida um, in Miami Beach, built what was considered the first major um, hotel in the United States developed and owned by an African-American. That was the Royal Palm in South Beach. Um, and by the way, that didn't come about 
without any kind of confrontation, just FYI. That was a result of a tourism boycott in Miami-Dade County because back in the early 90s, when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison, he made a tour. He stopped at Cuba on the way into Miami. And then when he got to Miami, they had given him the key to the city. But then the Cuban exile community was upset that he stopped in Cuba. So the city took the key to the city back from one of the greatest leaders of our time, um, Nelson Mandela. And so at that point, the black community led by the NAACP started a tourism boycott of Miami-Dade. Ultimately, they settled it because while there was a large, diverse community of African Americans in Miami-Dade, nobody was in the tourism industry and no one owned a hotel. So it created the environment for that hotel. And I, from, as a they didn't have a local developer in, Wa in Miami to scale. So uh, me as a Washingtonian, I happened to be on vacation there, read about it and bid on the project. And that was our, our first, supposed to be our first hotel, but instead a building I bought then uh, the kind of historic uh, grayish building. Um, that was our first hotel, and that's a, a courtyard by Marriott. It's one of the top five performing um, in their system worldwide. And uh, that was our first hotel that got opened in 1999. The Royal Palm was opened in 2002, right after 9-11, early two th late 2002, early 2003. The company, fast forward now, is a four plus billion dollar development business we do business around the country um, from Miami, um, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston, San Francisco, Las Vegas, and uh, we're expanding into uh, Los Angeles as well and, of course, Charlotte. Um, and, uh, and so and our company's committed to equal economic opportunity, one, because of the historic aspect of our business and because of you know, who I am and what I believe in. Um, we create environments of opportunity. And so we're going to do that here as a team. Um, as I said earlier, 35% um, uh, minority women-owned business um, opportunity. Uh, we have been able to do that, um, do similar percentages on our projects across the board, including the one we're currently working on in New York City. It's about a $550 million development project. We have started um, previously in Washington, D.C., an entrepreneurial academy um, in the hospitality industry, and we look to do that. Um, here in Charlotte so we can expose young people to the benefits and the transformative opportunities um, in entrepreneurship. And, uh, and, and we want to, to do that um, here in Charlotte. And with that, um, I would ask Monty to come up and Monty Ritchie to come up and talk or hobble up and come up uh, and talk to us about uh, the great things that conformity has done. This is what happens. He goes to meet with banks, and he comes out hobbling like this because <laughs> it's very hard to raise capital. Uh, so Conformity Corp is a local development company, and uh, we've been at it since uh, 1993. Uh, we have about $250 million in completed development in Charlotte-Mecklenburg. Everything's within uh, three miles of trade and try on. Uh, on this slide, you see uh, the Williamson in the upper left is uh, mixed-use office and housing. On the upper right is housing. On the lower right is housing in a 1911 uh, historic building, the largest historic building left in Elizabeth uh, uh, National Register District, uh, also right near Uptown. And then uh, the uh, building on the lower left is a mixed-use office and uh, retail building that is a, uh, an architectural sort of gatepost to uh, Southboro, which is a, a much larger uh, mixed-use development that includes a full-size Lowe's Home Improvement Center. Uh, in South End that's uh, wrapped with housing and uh, retail. That's the one that folks tend to, uh, to recognize. Uh, we had uh, the opportunity to get involved in this project late last year. Uh, we advanced through the RFQ and then uh, thanks to uh, a relationship with Stantec, uh, we were introduced uh, to Peebles and uh, we've been uh, pursuing the project together since then. Um, Southboro, uh, I'm going to just spend a minute on this because we're going to be talking a little bit about um, local retail. So uh, Don obviously covered the uh, the economic opportunity piece, and we've talked about that some before in our sessions that were dedicated um, to uh, uh, MSWEE uh, opportunities, uh, minority uh, women-owned and small business opportunities. And we have uh, 
opportunities in the uh, retail area where we're going to be opening inline retail and other types of retail. And we really want to stretch there as well to find opportunities for uh, folks to participate. To get that done, you need, you, you need to have folks on the team who have some experience doing some innovative retail. This happens to be the only horizontally integrated uh, large format retail in the country where the housing is veneered uh, directly to a, uh, uh, to a large format store. So hard to make out in the slide, but obviously you're looking at the big roof of the Lowe's there. And if there's a fire, people egress directly through the housing, which is a, uh, a building code matter that I'm not going to bore you with, but it's kind of clever. And um, we get the chance to run our mouths about that every once in a while. This is uh, something that's a little more uh, tame, uh, simple assembly over the course of about 10 years, uh, actually in the process of uh, trading this uh, real estate right now in anticipation of the uh, Brooklyn project. But, you know, it looks fairly boring, but there's four, trunk, uh, four tracks of land there. That's a shopping center that grew organically over the course of about 15 years. And uh, we had to buy each of those pieces, and, and we did so, and just put it on our balance sheet and worked on it for 10 years. And uh, as soon as we completed it, a big institutional player came along and uh, offered to take it off our hands. And what you see there on the bottom is uh, substantially similar to what they'll, they'll be doing. That's actually our rendering, but they like it, and they're going to key off of that. Um, one of the other uh, local members, is, local team members going to be working with is a fellow named Adam Williams. Um, my firm owns a part of Legacy, Re I own a part of Legacy Real Estate Advisors, which is a full uh, service commercial real estate firm brokerage. And uh, Adam is expert at uh, urban street level retail. So um, the Epicenter, which I'm sure anybody who's uh, in Charlotte knows the Epicenter uptown, is owned by the CIM uh, group, one of the largest REITs in the country. And um, they, uh, they bought that uh, out of the downturn, out of a bankruptcy. It was uh, developed by the Ghazi uh, company. And uh, Adam has that assignment, which is about a 200,000 square foot urban assignment over five levels. These, these two pieces that you see here, one's on South Church and a little uh, up top on the, on the uh, left and top on the right is a simple rendering of uh, how that uh, also an institutional owner intends to convert that to about seven or 8,000 square feet of retail. And I mention that because for those of you who have been in Charlotte for a long time, you know, our, we had no retail, then we had the Overstreet Mall, which turned out to be you know, kind of a uh, less than ideal uh, outcomes there, right? And um, and we're slowly making our way back to street level conditions, and um, and now we find that institutional building owners are just hungry for this, and they're looking for every little nook and cranny where they can fit something. On the lower left, there's a backflow preventer there, and remnants of an old alleyway. That red vault that you see sitting on the ground there on the lower left has some fire control equipment in it. And um, the Hearst Tower owner uh, just kind of stopped at this is a pain in the pain in the neck, and we're not going to pursue it. And uh, Adam got involved, and uh, they uh, hired some fire control experts, and they solved the problem. And uh, C level will be open, uh, newly constructed in that space in the next year or so. Uh, these are some groups that Adam has uh, worked with. Um, lots of brands there that you'll recognize. Uh, more importantly, he's working with a lot of institutional caliber real estate owners and helping them figure out their their retail problems. Um, Jennifer Stanton is also on our team who consulted with Faison on South Park Mall. Uh, she's currently w working with the county team on the redeployment of the uh, main library branch uptown. Uh, she is a uh, professor at um, Johnson & Wales University, and I think her PhD is in uh, behavioral psychology, you know, like why do you turn right when you walk into a retail store, that type of thing, like the spooky stuff on why you put the chips at this eye level, you know, so she's, she's uh, got that background and a uh, very strong uh, team member. We're happy to have her on board. So we're doing about a quarter million square feet there currently is what we're planning and what we want to talk to um, talk to the group about tonight. And I, s I feel like I have to address this for folks who haven't been here before. Uh, you know, typically turnout is, uh, we're happy to have a small group, an intimate group tonight. Typically our turnouts have been between, you know, 60 and 100. So don't talk badly about us whenever you leave tonight. This is a little, a little bit lighter turnout for us this evening. Um, we'll have a uh, grocery opportunity there, which of course will be a larger firm. Uh, typically what you'll see on the heels of grocery, just in terms of populating a retail space of this size, will be some services. And then uh, if your grocery and your personal services are coming together and your food and your housing, uh, and of course we have about 1,200 units of housing there, um, you really know that you've uh, 
ended up in the uh, sort of Shangri-La of, real, of, uh, of retail, if you will, if you can get to a place where you're delivering soft goods, um, clothing, furniture, um, you know, household, household type stuff, uh, household uh, belongings. And it, it's difficult to get to a place, and Charlotte hasn't yet, uptown. Uh, we would be going back there, right, because Belk used to be uptown, Ivy's used to be uptown. So how do you get back to that place? Uh, West Elm down in uh, the Metropolitan uh, is doing some soft goods now. So we'll be looking for opportunities to do that. But alongside of that, we're going to have other opportunities. You know, when we talk about groups like this, I mean, f- frankly, many of these many of these groups are going to be, you know, things are going well for for. Uh, for Don and for me, um, these are going to be brands that you recognize. They're going to be credit-worthy brands, uh, but we're not. We do not intend to populate our retail entirely uh, with only those types of companies. So, what we want to talk about a little bit tonight is our uh, approach to some of our inline. How do we, how do we ensure that, alongside of say the affordable housing piece that we're doing and some of the other efforts that we have underway to ensure that we uh, have an environment that's reflective of of our vi- value system, uh, that some of which Don covered so eloquent, elo- eloquently and that I share. Um, how do we get folks into these retailing spaces, uh, small businesses, minority owned? Uh, and so it starts with deliberate underwriting. Um, you know, if I walk into a space uh, and um, I present some financial statements and uh, and I can trot out a ba- uh, you know a bank statement that shows that I've got a few dollars. Um, have, and uh, you know, have a conversation with the landlord. Chances are, I'm going to be underwritten properly, uh, given a good a good once over, and uh, maybe I get some upfit money out of the deal. Uh, I can't speak from experience from this on this, but uh, perhaps that it doesn't go that way for everyone. Uh, so that's uh, just a choice to underwrite deliberately everything that comes uh, through the door, every opportunity that comes through the door. And, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, again, you know, I'm going to co-op something from Don here. I mean, we're, you know, we're not looking to underwrite businesses that are going to fail. Uh, we're looking to underwrite businesses, um, that, uh, are going to succeed, but who otherwise might not have seen the light of day where they're not given the proper deference, given the proper attention, right? And that's just a decision. Uh, it's just a, we're going to try harder, work harder to see every plan and to make, um, conscious decisions, deliberate underwriting. A variety of spaces, so oftentimes retail opens at around 2,000 square feet, so we'll offer some smaller spaces just to drive down the gross cost of the lease by way of fewer square feet. Uh, And then we hope to be a resource over time, and our website is already behaving like this in many ways for for those of you who have uh, started using it. Uh, It's a repository for MWSBE vendors and others who are uh, folks who want to drop narrative and history of Brooklyn. Those tools are all available. And over time, we'll continue to develop tools that are related to um, launching your small business. Uh, You may have picked up some materials from us tonight out front that had some basics and some tools locally uh, related to um, getting going with your small business or growing your small business. So we'll uh, we'll be a resource through through our website um, where those tools are concerned. So I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this. This is a, you know, obviously a bunch of words, but what you see here is uh, a number of different um, gaps that uh, consultants have said to us, hey, there's there's room for um, these items in the marketplace. Uh, the marketplace wants to spend $10 on these items, and today the market is only giving them the opportunity to spend $7 on these items. Uh, and those gaps vary, uh, and, uh, and of course, Filling up our space with the right mix of uses and in the right order is an art form more so than a science. Uh, but we just want to mention here that there are a lot of opportunities uh, to um, to populate uptown with additional retail, and we're going to pursue some of those. A big element of what we hope to achieve there uh, will be centered around food. If we succeed in landing the right grocer and uh, and putting together our plan properly, there will be a food-centric element um, that is... Uh, Um, concentrated, uh, perhaps keys off the park, um, keys off of a festival street that we're going to talk about in a minute, so that the the food and the retail and how they're oriented all become part of um, a uh, a well-thought-out plan that points to energy, points to the 18-hour-a-day activity, um, you know, just feels, uh, everybody here I'm sure has been in some great urban place where, you know, it's just Magical might be a little strong, but, you know, activated, right? Like just incredible, 
You know, you're in that space and you're like, holy cow, this is just incredible. Well, those, those things don't, they don't happen by accident, right? I mean, you have to, you have to go out and, and, uh, and make conscious choices and, and, and do your best to, to respond to what it is that you're given. So food is going to be a big part of it. And um, getting the right, uh, the right food users there and getting them organized properly is going to be key. Of course, there's a huge art component to what it is that we're doing. The history of Brooklyn uh, will be told horizontally and vertically there with installations uh, through key partnerships. Um, currently uh, working on developing a relationship with the Gantt Museum. Uh, others will include the Arts and Science Council and so on, and of course former residents and other stakeholders who can help us guide our, our narrative, um, because who, who better to guide the narrative, right? I mean, we're, we, don't, we don't own that narrative. Um, others own that narrative, so we'll, we'll work with them as we, as we have been. Uh, so when we think about local businesses uh, and, and the opportunity that we, opportunities we might be able to present to this audience and, and hopefully others, you know, what type of groups are we looking at? Um, you know, it is going to be a brand new, brand new development. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, the, the space is not going to be cheap, right? I mean, there'll be, the, the space is pretty expensive, frankly, but small, you know, smaller spaces doing everything we can to get the cost down, maybe work on some upfits. You know, who, who are these businesses? So I, I tried to get to three locally that folks would recognize. These are all minority-owned businesses, and I had um, a, uh, a retailer, a service retailer, and a service outfit. So the retailer, uh, who's a, a gentleman quite successful, uh, owns a company called Social Status. Um, so anybody who's been in Charlotte for a while and knows the Miracle Mile on Central Avenue uh, knows social status. So uh, chic uh, and uh, um, hip-hop, you know, street boutique, high dollar, you know, $300 sneakers, that type of thing. He owns three or four other brands. He's active in Pittsburgh with two locations, Greensboro, Raleigh. Um, but I couldn't get his permission to use his stuff. Uh, his, vis his business is the most evolved, and I had the hardest time getting access to his brand. So, um, but uh, Social Status is a great example uh, of a company that would do, uh, we, we, would, we would do well to have in our, in our, uh, in our development. Um, new is, uh, is uh, waxing and nails and that type of thing. Uh, the owner um, recognized for uh, any number of accomplishments as a business owner. We think of this as service, uh, service retail. Obviously, there are services being provided there, a number of different products for sale, um, and uh, should be a perfect fit uh, if we turned out to be a fit uh, for, um, for them. Uh, no Grease, uh, I think also super visible locally. And, um, you know, two brothers, a couple locations now. Um, I think it was actually um, Bob Johnson played a role in helping them get going in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the Time Warner Arena. Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, today, you know, it seems like uh, really no limit for those guys. You know, they're off to the races. I've not heard them speak, but I know that they I know that they do speak uh, and lead on these issues. I think with others and uh, others who are trying to get their uh, businesses going. And um, I uh, I want to recognize one of the Johnson brothers who I've not met before who's here this evening. So thank you for being here. Uh, one of the No Grace owners uh, here in the back on the left. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, and I hope you'll I hope you'll get us with some questions or some comments maybe as we get into the Q and A would be super super helpful. Um, so. So where do we go uh, with these uh, with these opportunities? We're going to look quickly at our plan again, um, and I apologize that I don't uh, that I don't have a laser pointer to help us out here. But along along Second Street, um, there are uh, a number of small uh, small retailing opportunities. Uh, these are great spots for folks to uh, to make a home. Um, these larger uh, red boxes that you see on the right are more anchor oriented. Those are 40,000 square feet, 39,000 square feet. As you move on down second and go closer to uptown, um, the, uh, the spaces get smaller, what we call inline retail for those of you who, who uh, maybe aren't involved in retail in any way. That's where we have to find the opportunities to, uh, uh, to uh, capture diversity and uh, achieve a goal of uh, inclusion so that when you're walking around um, Brooklyn Village, um, we don't all look the same, right? So uh, we don't all look like me, quite frankly. Uh, so Second Street uh, Retail, this is looking into the development towards uptown from uh, McDowell. 
uh, just an example of how storefronts might behave. Uh, for those of you who have been to, um, uh, say, Charleston or Coral Gables, uh, many cities in Europe, I like this rendering here on the uh, uh, that is uh, reflective of some of the restaurant uh, frontages, and the, how this wall on the right is uh, collapsible. You know, so that the separation between the public realm and the private realm uh, begins to uh, to evaporate a little bit. So we want to we want to do be doing everything we can scientifically with the development of the retail and and prospecting and capturing tenants, but also uh, getting the planning right. You know, if we don't have the if we don't have the right plan. Um, these other efforts will fall flat on their face because uh, inclusion, no inclusion, if it's just a bad retail plan, nobody's going to succeed, right? So um, so we feel good about the, the approach we're taking there. The um, the park in the green and the, and the left, uh, up on the top there, top left, we, we added this slide recently because we started thinking about how Second Street uh, access could be controlled because it just dead ends into the back of the First Baptist Church. So this, uh, this street really lends itself to um, being programmed as an urban, urban cul-de-sac uh, opportunistically, you know, episodically. Every once in a while, we just close the street, and the parkland just flows right into the street, and the street flows right into the restaurants and the retail, and that all becomes one, uh, one big organism. So uh, really, you know, I want to I pitch hard the spaces on, the, on, uh, on Second Street as being just a, a phenomenal place uh, to to operate a business, for really for anyone. So um, please share that with folks. And, and there's a there's one little space there. If you look very closely uh, at the little storefronts that that front the Festival Street, you know, there's a tiny little space there in line that might be a thousand square feet that's smaller than the other spaces. That's an example. We we want to create several opportunities like that where the where the gross amount of space is smaller. I should say. We're going to have folks who show up who are minority-owned businesses who do not need 800 and 1,000 square foot spaces, which is kind of the, is, uh, could be implied from the presentation. I don't mean to be saying that. Rather, we will create those opportunities where folks are more well-heeled and can do 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 square feet. Those things are going to take care of themselves. We don't need to worry about that part. Uh, we just need to worry about the opportunities where the challenges are greater. And of course, uh, Myers Passage uh, runs on across uh, and out of frame here and hits Stonewall. Uh, Stonewall is a little more car oriented. You know, we're, we're between Stonewall and 277 here. So it's a little bit tougher to, to bring this down to, uh, to scale. Um, but there is a lot of retail happening there. And I'll just run through this quickly, you know, near the top of this slide. Uh, and moving uh, uh, again out of frame is the Whole Foods uh, deal that Crescent is doing. And Whole Foods itself is 47,000 square feet. They have another 15,000 feet of retail going in there alongside the Whole Foods. Then you have the Northwood Raven uh, Tower, uh, which is in uh, gray, somewhere between 14 and 20 stories. I've seen it rendered uh, different ways, but always with 8,000 feet of retail. And then you move uh, down to uh, the Pro uh, Prophet Dixon Venture, which is uh, at the uh, intersection of Stonewall and Alexander. They have uh, between five and 10,000 feet. And then you get to our projects, which start with a, a Staybridge Hotel there in the corner, and then we move into some housing and an office building. And we have another anchor tenant at the hard corner of Stonewall and McDowell, and, uh, and a number of smaller uh, opportunities um, along Stonewall. But you'll see that they are larger i mean you don't have to know a, a ton about planning you can see how small some of those blue boxes are there and then you look at something that's scaled similarly on stone one you can see how these red boxes are a little bit larger here so that might be something like a vitamin shop or a nike store just a little more car oriented right you're not going to get out and walk around so you can go to the vitamin shop and you know that type of thing but um they're a necessary part of the mix if we want to get to a place where say the restaurants and the inline retail that is smaller is is thriving you know you want to bring you want to bring pre pieces of all of that this is a uh, this is just an image of the um, the anchor on the left uh, coupled up next to the office tower lobby on McDowell at Stonewall it's uh, it's this office tower uh, piece on the left that you see here how that fronts uh, how that fronts McDowell so a big, a big part of the way that we bring those, those uh, dynamics together is through Myers Passage, which we've talked about at a number of different uh, presentations. Myers Passage glues Brooklyn Village North and Brooklyn Village South together. It, uh, 
occurs on the old Meyer Street uh, road lie, uh, which um, uh, is adjacent to the gymnasium, one of the few uh, historic buildings left in uh, Brooklyn, the Second Ward High School gymnasium. Uh, and also the Meyer Street Elementary School um, was, of course, named after uh, Meyer Street. So historically, very significant uh, street. Tons of other background there we could cover, but I'll, I'll spare you that. Uh, we're excited about it as an organizational tool, as a planning tool, and it happens to work really well for retail as well. It's not hard to picture a situation where, uh, or a day in the life where you have a family in town that is um, perhaps uh, using the Mecklenburg Aquatic Center uh, in the, uh, in the uh, center of the frame here just below the candy cane path, which is Myers Passage. And uh, those meets are sometimes three and four days long, right? So uh, a family comes into town, they stay at the Staybridge Hotel, they go to the swim meet, um, somebody forgot a pair of Speedos, they walk across the street to the more vehicular-oriented shops, five to 10,000 feet, they buy some athletic gear, they head to the meet, take a break on the meet, they cross the street to Brooklyn Village North, they have a sandwich, they go to the grocery store, go back to the meet, head to Staybridge where there's a small kitchenette, and they've got some you know, potato chips and cold cereal for the next day that they picked up at the grocery store that they can use while they're staying at the Staybridge. Um, entirely realistic scenario on how um, the north and south elements uh, get used and how it is that um, Myers Passage uh, will ideally bring them together. These are just examples of the types of things that are happening with large format stores so that when we think about targets, when we think about Lowe's Home Improvement Center, Home Depot, and others, uh, Walmart, and you know, even I'll say even Walmart. In fact, I think we have a Walmart. There it is. Um, you know, they will stretch. Um, they will do things that you wouldn't think they uh, are either willing to do or capable of doing uh, if they really want to be in a given uh, in a given place. So uh, we will uh, we will rely on them, and of course, on our team. Uh, to force their hand to make sure that we get top quality outcomes whenever we are dealing with uh, large format retailers. And we have, we have three of those opportunities programmed on the site. And then uh, we'll be looking at best practices for uh, traditional urban storefronts. Uh, Charlotte is now doing some uh, pop-ups, as some of you may be aware. I was explaining to one of my partners earlier that uh, I mustn't be on the right, uh, I mustn't be following the right Twitter feeds or uh, be on the right uh, Instagram uh, channels because I've never been to a pop-up event and I never know when they're happening. But I hear, sto I hear stories and apparently uh, they do quite well whenever they, uh, whenever they occur in Charlotte. So um, uh, we'll get guidance uh, on those opportunities and uh, Myers Passage is a great place for that type of thing to, uh, to unfold. Uh, along the edge of our park and 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 along the uh, park passageway that is that is Myers Passage, so um, you can rely on us to to get to a place where the platform is excellent, um, that it is uh, ends up being a place where you would want to be uh, with your business. Um, what we want to do is make it clear to folks who are looking that we're going to do whatever we can to help inform the success of small businesses, minority in particular, who might want to be uh, in this space, and we're going to be doing that uh, proactively. So there's some tools here uh, that uh, the slides go up. They, all these slides go up on our, uh, on our uh, web page and on the Mecklenburg County web page. Um, these are the types of things that we'll continue to populate our website with. Um, we have, uh, uh, I want to cover quickly what else we have coming, and then we'll do some question and answer. Uh, we're going to be doing this again tomorrow morning at 11.30, as Dennis mentioned, um, and uh, invite you back to that and anyone else who you think uh, might be interested. And then a couple weeks out, we're going to be doing uh, stakeholder panels, which is just an overview of the work that we've done uh, to date, uh, more general in nature rather than topical. And those uh, times and locations will be announced, and the, uh, the town hall meeting will be on October 20th. Uh, at that town hall meeting, we report out to the public uh, generally on what it is that we've been uh, learning to date and um, uh, obviously an overview and then what it is we've been hearing and how we're responding to what it is that we've uh, been hearing. I'm going to use this lull very quickly to answer a question that was asked uh, in the last session that my partner uh, Jeffrey Simon asked me to um, to address. Some of you were in that session. Uh, um, we were asked about the uh, how our own companies um, were put together 
uh, from a minority participation perspective. And Stantec, which is a huge firm, uh, wanted the opportunity to do some work on that. And uh, Jeffrey asked that I pass along that as of 2015, uh, 31 percent of the um, staff at Stantec are uh, women and 19 percent of the staff are minority. Uh, they have had a very active year of acquisitions in 2016, adding close to 10,000 people. So we don't have those statistics yet, but I wanted to pass on uh, what we do have because it was a question that had been asked and we weren't able to uh, answer it at the time. By the way, I think that that gives us an opportunity also. Um, why don't we have Jeffrey actually, oops, oops, actually come up. And uh, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey brought us together. Um, also has a, aside from his role at Stantec, was also the Assistant Secretary of uh, the Department of Transportation in uh, Massachusetts, and uh, so knows quite a bit about uh, um, empowering uh, minority and small businesses as well, so. We're a publicly traded company, so we collect uh, all kinds of numbers. Uh, I did want to report those, as, Mont as Monty said. Uh, and, uh, and we have very active programs both within the company and, w and uh, externally to try to encourage the kinds of things that Don was talking about. So we're happy to be an active and, and very vocal participant in that regard. Uh, it is interesting that as a design firm, uh, literally uh, uh, the, uh, the, the graduates of architecture and engineering, which is what most of our company is, uh, are overwhelmingly female, and that has been a dramatic shift in the design uh, firms uh, nationally. So we see these trends, we want to capture them, we want to work with them, and we want to fold them right into the entire Brooklyn Village ethic that you've heard uh, Don and Monty talk about. Thanks, Don. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Montgomery. I'm a, an attorney. I have my own law practice here in Charlotte. And first and foremost, I want to say uh, thank you for presenting this project. And certainly, I am um, encouraged by the goals and the plans that I've heard thus far. This is my first meeting, so I'm glad to be a part of what's going on. Certainly, want to know more about what opportunities would there exist for professional services like uh, a law firm such as my own to participate in this process and and what we can do to help uh, make sure that the word is continually spread throughout the community for, about this opportunity. Well, good, good. You know, look, we are committed um, with our 35 percent goal across all disciplines from not just hard cost and so forth, but also professional services is a key. And in fact, we are in going through the evaluation process of engaging a law firm. and. Uh, None of the firms that we have spoken to locally um, meet the goals in terms of criteria that we're looking for to have 35% of their firm be minority or women. So we have sent the ones out that we are considering to come back to us with some partnership relationships um, that will get us to those numbers or we're going to have to go outside of the city of Charlotte to get our talent. But we're not going to compromise in that space um, either. So, um, so there are opportunities right now for professional legal services. And then, of course, um, Jeffrey can speak to the professional services because um, his firm is leading all of the design efforts for us, but they are looking for consultants and so forth now as well. Yeah, I will tell you, if any of, uh, any of the, the people who are here tonight are in any of the design, engineering, landscape engineering, my name is Belandra Foster. My company is BB Foster Consulting. I'm few of the li few of the female African American licensed professional civil engineers with a PhD in civil engineering, and I would like to be involved with this project. So that was I was hinging on his question. Also, um, I noticed on your website that you listed engineers, and I was wondering how to get engaged, and that's why I'm I, here I tonight. think you just did. Actually, uh, you have our business card, and we, I. I I'd really like to talk with you with, uh, after the, uh, the session tonight. We are actively and aggressively trying to, as, as Donna Monte have said, trying to gather uh, people who can help in this effort. Um, you know, at the, at the small business forum that we had, what was the number, Monte? 35% of 683? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, 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 like 221 million. 221 million dollars or something is our, is our target. And uh, we want to do that. 
with as, as, as much diversity of every kind as we can. So please come up and talk with me after this. Totally interested in a retail opportunity. Um, however, uh, in the services that I provide, even still with my, uh, my own establishment, like photography is actually one of those. Will there be any opportunity for photography in terms of like documenting the process, uh, like from the ribbon cutting to building, uh, anything like that for even marketing, you know, the particular property once it's built, showing models and stuff like that, and how likewise can uh, uh, we be considered for that? Absolutely, um, all of the above. And uh, Monty is here on the ground. You should contact him or his, and, his, and his firm and speak with them about it, but we're looking for all of those. There's, you know, a large amount. It's glad you were, I'm glad you were, you know, focused on that because in the development business, people think of bricks and mortar, but there's marketing, public relations, communications, and the like. And so, of course, we're going to need photography services across the board. I, I, I can tell you that uh, I've, I've already spoken with several uh, photographers and photography firms who've contacted me because even in the design phase, we use a lot of photography services. So uh, just make sure that you do get your information to us and we're doing a pretty good job of, of keeping those lists current. Stay visible and not, uh, you know, not take the, the first email or the first phone call or, um, that is missed or you know, reset for another call. As, uh, as evidence that something's not going to come together. It's a busy time. Lots and lots and lots of people contacting us. Uh, our main tool right now is to capture the information and record it uh, so that we have it for future use. Um, and, uh, and that may well be the case uh, when we're communicating with you about photography. Um, but don't be put off by that. The, the key is to get the information to us. And also, if you're not MWSBE certified, uh, you would be well advised um, to become MWSBE certified uh, because then we're incented even more completely to make sure that, uh, that we're working with you because it goes to the benefit of what it is the team's trying to achieve, what it is that the county is trying to achieve, uh, lots of people watching what it, our representations. Um, and of course, you'll get additional uh, opportunities, not just from us, but from others if you, if you get that done. So if uh, you're not familiar with that process, please watch the videos from, uh, from our earlier sessions on MWSB, and you'll get a, you'll get a quick you know, Series 100 class on that, to, on, on how to move through that process. Hi, Tiffany Fant um, with Ubuntu Community Project. This is the meeting I've been waiting for. Um, is there an opportunity to partner with you all about identifying some of the businesses that we can kind of grow and identify to take those small places. For example, there's a men's boutique that is established, doing well, um, but to make sure that over the next year, two, three years, that the progression is made so that you always say this is credit worthy. Um, yes, we would consider if A, B, C, D, E, F, and G is met, that we can almost, almost guarantee that you have position. Um, of course, meeting all the details, because, you know, I'll advocate for no grease, um, but I don't think they need my help. <laughs> but, you know, for the smaller businesses that are doing well um, and creating a program uh, of sorts, because it's one in place, and I would love to share it with you all to say, hey, you know, maybe we identify five businesses to go through this track, then we'll be comfortable saying we'll give you special consideration. Well, look, we want to get people and firms that are already in business. That's ideal. But at the same hand, we also want startups, too, because we want to create new opportunities, expand the job base, and create, hopefully create an environment for, for more entrepreneurs as well. But absolutely, we would want to um, you know, do that. I met that gentleman and his partner at a Charlotte Bobcats game maybe four years ago or f maybe four to five years ago when we were, had to have been five years ago when we were looking at Charlotte previously. So, look, we're, we, we want anyone who can send us um, prospective uh, tenants or retailers to come and bring them to us, absolutely. And we want to encourage people who have new ideas um, about businesses that are, you know, new concepts that are, you know, vi valid and viable, we want to hear from them too. So yes, you would definitely have that opportunity. And, and, and earlier runway we can get, the better. I think, you know, one of the things that's going to happen is once we start crystallizing our schedule, then I think we'll have, you know, a bit more certainty, which will get the entrepreneurs to focus because they may expand before we're ready and we may be the third expansion or the like. But we're definitely receptive to that. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Maurice Jones, and I have a vocational training program in construction trades for Afro-American males. And I wanted to talk to you about the entrepreneurial part and, you know, the things that you have in entrepreneur that we could possibly partner with to help create wealth for Afro-American males. Well, look, first of all, we're going to, you know, make it a point to have our general contractor and our subcontractors to actively participate in an app apprentice program um, so that we can take a pathway to take um, you know, people who don't have skill, um, skills and develop skills so they become skilled labor. At the same hand, we certainly want to be supportive of um, new startup businesses and the like as well. Um, our Entrepreneurial Academy is geared towards focusing on young people, high school age students, to expose them early on uh, to the benefits of entrepreneurship because I think what happens is our society overall, one, tells our young people that if, you know, they need to be athletes or entertainers in order to achieve success financially. Um, they make um, other areas more mysterious. I think, you know, look, um, but, but if you look at the exposure, the limited exposure our young people get to entrepreneurship, we want to change that. So we want to, what we tried to do in D.C. at the Hospitality High School, we did an entrepreneurial academy there, is when a young person walks into a McDonald's, to be thinking, that's a business owned by an entrepreneur who bought a franchise license from McDonald's. And when another young person is working in Burger King behind the counter, to be grateful while they're earning minimum wage, they're actually getting paid to learn from the ground up on how to run a Burger King or when they go on a school trip and stay at a Holiday Inn or a Marriott, that they recognize Holiday Inn as a fictitious name owned by no one, identifiable to no one other than the shareholders. It's a business, and that that Holiday Inn is owned by an entrepreneur who bought a licensing right from them. So to start thinking like entrepreneurs, even the music that they listen to, that that was the device they're using, was created most likely by Steve Jobs, an entrepreneur, and that the music that they're listening to has been produced by an entrepreneur. So it's a mindset change early. So that's what we're focusing on in terms of the entrepreneurial um, effort, in terms of an institute for entrepreneurship. In terms of um, apprentice, that's something that we're looking to do across the board on contracting and the like. Answer your question? Thank you. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yes, my name is Rusty Mills with MNF Bank, and uh, I'm a native Charlottean. Parents went to Second Ward High School, 25-plus uh, year banker. Uh, and so I want to talk about the part about the uh, entrepreneurship. We just had a conference, a small business conference sponsored by us, Charlotte City Partners, City Partners and others. This past Saturday, over 100 minority-owned businesses, franchisees were out there. Uh, Eric was a panelist. Damien was a speaker. And so it's an opportunity for us as a bank to say, and I know we're going to partner, we're going to get some time with you, Don, individually, but I know we're looking to just do exactly what you said, get people on that runway now. So we have lunch and learn series to get small business owners that coaching, that technical assistance they need now, matching them with resources around the city and county. We work, we work with the county. Uh, Dennis, we work with uh, Peter Ziller's team as he's building out his, his small business program. We work with the city uh, with their small business program and, and a small business capital fund. So we're just here to say, you know, we're in the community, m &F Bank, we're here to do uh, some financing where it may be possible. We're here to do some entrepreneurship training, get people ready. Uh, we're here to do some uh, uh, programs and services training, literacy financial training. And so we're here to offer a whole wide variety of services. And we just want to be a partner with you guys, and hopefully we can do a lot of great things. Mine, I know you've talked to my counterpart, Tanya yeah. Richardson, um, and, I mean, Tanya Dowell about this. So we just want to keep getting that partnership to a point where we can actually sit down and actually get some stuff Perfect. locked down. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Great, same here. And by the way, by the way, I appreciate that. One of the things now that he just did is advertise and market his product. What part of what our entrepreneurial academy does is it teaches young people about banking and finance. Because when it, if we go into a restaurant, we expect the service to be good, the food to be good, and the menu to be reflective of what we want. It's a product that they're selling, and we're the customer. We go into your hair uh, sh a shop. We're expecting you to do it the right way, the way we want it, and to give us service promptly and give us a fair value. So in banking, we teach young people to understand they're renting money. 
So the bank, bank has a product. It's money. Now they'll give you financial services and advice along with it, but it's money. It's our, and the number one product they have is, and, and the number one product they offer is renting money. So they, and if the money stays in the bank, then they make no money. In fact, they lose money. Um, so you are a consumer. So if you're credit worthy and are going to pay it back, you're a customer. And just like there's not just one fast food um, burger shop, there's McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and probably some others, they have more than one bank. And so the bank that respects you and gives you more service and responds to you when you need it, that's the bank to go to. Now, by and large, I tell the big banks that they're like umbrella salesmen. They are selling umbrellas like there's no tomorrow. The umbrellas are on sale as long as it's a clear, sunny day. They're trying to sell you umbrellas like there's no tomorrow. Let there be rain, though, and they want their umbrellas back, or they won't give up any more umbrellas. And so the key is to find banks that practice a business of recognizing that you're a customer. And I think that was one of the things I talked about earlier that was surprising to me that in the banking center, the second largest banking center in the country, the small minority businesses and women-owned businesses are struggling to get access to capital. And where I am, I spend most of my time in New York, they can't throw it at you quick enough. So it's surprising to me, and I think um, I applaud you for making some steps for the bank to, to make sure that changes by reaching out to customers. Monta, you spoke a little bit about the uh, dynamism and the diversity that you want the project to have, and you want that to follow through with the type of retail that you have in this, in the uh, development. But can you speak to the uh, what kind of uh, musings you guys have about what type of anchor tenants there would be? And then I have a follow-up question, if possible. So today, when we think about anchor tenants, we think of uh, grocery stores and junior boxes. So a junior box might be an REI, for instance, um, 30, 30 to 40,000 square foot uh, formats. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, the um, you know the inclusive the inclusion piece doesn't really uh, enter uh, the picture or hasn't. Good, um, but hasn't entered the picture on these larger uh, spaces. Um, so three, three large format stores, another 50, 60,000 square feet or so of, um, of uh, mid-sized stores, say three to 7,000 feet, and then uh, inline and food. And, we, and by the way, we would like to see a minority, a woman-owned big box store, you know, because that concept, by the way, is there's an association. Now, I've tried in, in my company to break this association. There's an association when it comes to diversity, minority. It's small and embryonic. So, you know, but I'm a big believer that entrepreneurs are dreamers. That's all they are is they're dreamers. It's an inexact science. And so you can have a small dream or you can have a big dream. So, and they're all those dreams in between and they're diverse. So same thing, you know, with my, the minority community, should be diverse. So we're looking for a big box, minority owned or women owned firm or both that has the capacity to grow. Um, because again, it's just like another business. Bob Johnson started BET um, and it wasn't even on, many, the cable was embryonic in its, in its phase at that point in time too. My friend uh, Robert Smith um, started Vista and you know, to do software operating systems, and now is the fourth largest, um, you know, software company in the world. So, so we're open. Um, and with that um, openness that you guys expressed, the follow-up question is um, not to place you guys on the um, on the hot seat, but just in terms of the recent events and some of the economic redirecting. Uh, that we're trying to accomplish in terms of, uh, like you say, going with banks that may have that buy-in for you or, or uh, companies that may have that buy-in for you. Um, since you're still open, is there a possibility that a big box could be some type of uh, venue? For instance, like the CIAA may be able to use, it seems like they would be able to show that type of traction or yearly balance, but if they didn't want to go with the traditional uh, establishments that we have in, in downtown Charlotte right now, then there's not too much of an option. But if there's an African-American owned like venue space that can handle those types of events, could that be something that would? Yeah, I'm assuming recent events you're talking about the, the conflict um, that the city council is talking about probably right now. Okay, yeah, look, we, I talked about that a little earlier. Um, and the reality is, is that 
a big part, uh, first of all, as we all know, we're a capitalistic democracy. So the role of capitalism is to provide opportunities for everybody, make our nation a more perfect nation by including all involved in our prosperity. So unfortunately, that is not practiced when it, uh, frequently or as frequently as it should be when it comes to diversity. That is why part of the reason, the only reason, well, I'm in Charlotte because he told me about this wonderful project and insisted that I take a hard look at it, which was rejected by our then chief investment officer. But Jeffrey was persistent and called me directly, and then I looked at it. And the reason I'm here is because of the history of Brooklyn Village. Also, the reason I'm here is because uh, we want to do something transformative. And transformative means that the economic, it shouldn't be transformative, but the economic benefits are going to be more reflective of the demographics of the community that we're doing business in. So we're going to be open. Part, this, one of the reasons we're here tonight is to engage in discussions about how can we make it easier to do business with us. How can we make it easier for you all to consider our location as a place to do business? Everybody. So what we're saying, and we shouldn't have to say this, but we are saying it and saying it loud, that we are receptive to everybody. And, we, and look, it is not the first time that when, when one of the things Monty's talking about, when we're talking about building retail stores, well, there's this big TI build, a tenant allowance, where you have to build out the store. So sometimes small businesses, more often than not, don't um, want to pay the build-out cost for, or don't have the front, upfront money to pay for the build-out cost. So we have said we as developers will front that money if we like the idea. Now, that sounds innovative. But the last time I checked, Neiman Marcus rarely builds out their stores either. The developer ends up doing it. Last time I checked, these high-end departments, Victoria's Secret, rarely pays to build out their space. You go across the board, Sports Authority, all of them, the developer. I got Gordon Biersch in one of my buildings in downtown DC, and they're finally amortizing their tenant improvement dollars. So it's not unusual for that to happen. What's unusual is for an entrepreneur to take um, a chance on a emerging minority or woman-owned business. So we're just doing straight up business in a straight up way. So with a level playing field. This project is particularly important because it's, um, it's fully integrated in a way, meaning I don't know if you could ever live over the store, but you do have a workplace um, housing goal that is um, remarkable. And so maybe there would be a way too that you could integrate that into minority retail or some way so that eventually this particular project means you don't have to own a car. You could live, work, play in one location in Charlotte that, that would be actually, I think, quite remarkable for any city to, to notice. Yeah, I, yeah, look, I agree. But the whole idea, Monty could take this, but the whole idea is we don't want anybody to have a car in Brooklyn Village, other than the people coming to consume, and hopefully they'll walk from the surrounding areas. The goal is to make ourselves fully integrated. And you want to pick up on that because it's a big part of the yeah yeah um, sure. business model. Yeah, I'll touch on that quickly, and then and then also give the the mic to uh, to Jeffrey, whose firm, of course, is uh, controlling design. Um, but uh, you know, I used to have a, a fellow who worked for me who was just a phenomenal guy named Mike Davis, and uh, Mike was always pushing me to do green. Yeah, you know, let's go do a lead certified building. I said, well, when somebody shows up, when when a when a, a market contingent shows up and knocks on my door and says, I'd like you to go do green, and I'm willing to pay you an extra 10 percent to do it, we'll go do green because it just lives right there on the shelf. You just take the manual down, do it anytime you want to, whenever it makes sense in the marketplace. The thing that's beautiful about what it is that uh, I will say, I will claim is beautiful about what it is that we do day in and day out and uh, not dissimilar to what it is that Don does day in and day out is we use land more efficiently. Uh, we l use land very efficiently. We use uh, taxpayer dollars very efficiently. Um, all the infrastructure is in place, and if it's not, I pay for it, or Don pays for it, as the case may be. The developer pays for it. You're not extending roads for me. You're not putting water lines in, sewer lines. 
We drive down vehicle miles traveled. Every single time somebody moves into our uh, into one of our units, uh, we take the wear off of roads. We take carbon out of the air. So, um, you know, New York City is one of the greenest cities on the face of the planet, and it's not because it has the preponderance of LEED certified buildings. It's because it's extremely efficient use of land. Um, so uh, I think you'll see those benefits here. Uh, as a natural byproduct of doing, you know, 2.3 million, 2.4 million square feet on on um, uh, 16 and change acres, uh, perhaps more over time. Uh, we'll we'll see. But right now we're at about 2.3 million square feet. So I think there will be some green benefits just by way of density and quality planning. Thank you. Uh, one of the one of the great advantages of being uh, of working with a company like like. Uh, Stantec, the one that I work for, is that uh, we get to see things from all over the place. We've spent a lot of time at these sessions talking about a lot of the, the local issues and the, uh, the, the, the pieces that really uh, are the, the, the nuts and bolts and the grid of, of our development, and those are incredibly important. Uh, but I also uh, want to just make sure that you understand that we have the ability to draw on our sustainability group, for example. We have a whole group that does nothing but look at sustainable design, not only design but materials and the way that, they, that, uh, that those materials are assembled. Uh, we are also uh, allied with the two largest uh, uh, research projects on autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you think about the impact that autonomous vehicles have, for example, um, on even on our on our development, we have 2,200 roughly uh, parking spaces. And, and very impressive parking analysis. There. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's that's a that's a great point. Um, in our initial proposal, and this is what Monty was talking about, um, we looked at not building a space for exclusive use, but looked at where common sense can take take uh, take its place here. Where can a retail user who comes in nights, weekends, use a residential space. Uh, those spaces, the office space users on Saturday and Sunday uh, have no use for a parking space. So we can allocate those. So we looked at the overlap and drove that number down. The point I was making before, though, is that we, c we, we fully intend to look around to best practice, no matter where it is, and bring it right here to Brooklyn Village. And I think that's a very exciting kind of overlay as well. Really, due to her question, I was going to ask about the shared parking program. I saw it online and very complex, of course. But how, now that you've addressed that, do you plan to integrate other transit in the CAT system to help supplement your parking program? Because it's what you're doing is really novel to Charlotte. We don't have a shared parking program here, to my knowledge. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's interesting. I think Monty and I were both taken a little bit aback when the, the person who, is, uh, who worked on our shared parking program actually lives in Idaho. Um, there's probably five cars in Idaho. But uh, uh, I've spoken like a real East Coaster. Huh? Um, but uh, uh, we do. The, the short answer is uh, yes, we absolutely are going to. Uh, going to include that. You know, the thing about it is, is when you build real estate, you build for a future. You're not building for a past. Um, and so we have to really think about what that future is going to be uh, in, in 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years from now when these buildings will, will still be there. And so we need to include all of those transportation advances that you're, that you're talking about. I was just going to say it would be novel in this market, you know, for us to accept, you know, more than kind of the defined parking space. That's all we've ever seen here. Monty, you know that very well. So, But certainly we're evolving to that point as a community, so this would bring us here. Well, you'd, th you'd, you'd hope, right? I mean, I remember doing a presentation um, for some planners and uh, others at, at a ULI session, and Deborah, Deborah Campbell, who uh, um, uh, is with the city of Charlotte, was, um, was in the audience, and um, I joked about uh, the fact that we'll know we've arrived as a city when you can't find a place to park. Um, it is uh, remarkably easy to get parking here. And, uh, and I just want to preface this by saying I haven't vetted my next statement with either one of these two guys. So, and I'm, yeah, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a stool and I'm, and I'm, yeah, and I'm injured. So hopefully I'm safe. But, um, 
you know, it, it, I would be a little disappointed if our, if our site parked easily 24-7, 365 days a year. I mean, constantly with pinch points and an absolutely miserable parking situation, no. But parking easily every minute of every day, we've provided too much parking. Um, part of our analysis took into account the fact that there are thousands of surface overflow spaces available at per diem rates immediately adjacent to our land. Um, so, uh, you know, if something gets a little tight, you know, the, the, the parking's there. And it's, that, it's part of that evolution that you're talking about, Bobby, that, um, uh, that's just another way that, you know, it's certainly not as impactful as some of the other narratives that we're talking about, but it's just another narrative, right? I'm entitled to a parking space. That's a Charlotte narrative. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can, we can tenderize that a little bit, maybe, you know, break that, break that down some. It just has significant value to myself. I mean, I can't speak for everyone else, but like the MLK statue that's in Marshall Park is really nice. And if it's Brooklyn Village and that's something that, you know, he kind of like marched or fought for, like it'd be really cool to have it somewhat like old and new. You know what I mean? Well, I think um, uh, in our RFP and one of, one of the things that, you know, before I was aligned with these fellows recognized early on, that's a conversation that we need to have uh, act actively. I want to acknowledge Gwen Jackson in the office or in the audience who's been uh, helping me and the team with so many of these uh, of these issues. And, um, you know, one of them is, what do we, you know, how do we handle the, the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King statue, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, and frankly, I'm surprised. Uh, that's the first time we've ever gotten that question. Uh, if before going into our first session, somebody said to me, uh, what do you think your, you know, what questions do you expect to get tonight? I would probably list that as being one of the questions I expect to receive first. Um, that statue around its base uh, has a list of organizations that were involved in, uh, in making that project happen. Um, we have, by accident in some cases and by design in others, been in touch with many of those groups already. Uh, but we'll continue to reach out to those stakeholders. And ultimately, when we get to a place where that statue needs to be moved, that will be a decision that's made as part of a consensus um, that's driven primarily by folks other than our team. Maybe it's the Second Ward High School Gymnasium. Maybe it's somewhere in the park. Uh, but it's, it's going to be the result of open dialogue and uh, guidance that we receive from people other than the development team. And the county. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I want to categorically state on the record for the camera here and everybody else present that none of the monuments currently existing in Marshall Park will be lost as a result of this redevelopment. They may not be exactly where they are today. They may or may not be in the park proper, but they will not be lost. Uh, it's, it's important to mention, too, a lot of folks are familiar with the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King statue. There's also a Holocaust memorial uh, installation there that's a little bit more difficult to find along uh, McDowell, tucked away in a place that is remarkably off the beaten path. But uh, that is a, that's another marker that, uh, that will uh, go to um, whatever lengths are required to ensure that it's preserved somewhere, somehow. I just want to make one point of clarification. It wasn't him that said no on, it wasn't Greg Kohler who said no on the Charlotte deal. I did say former um, CIO, okay. <laughs> he was gung-ho for it. Um, okay, well, we thank you for being here, um, and uh, thank you for your insight and advice and guidance and your interest, and we're looking forward to a, a great partnership um, with the community, with all of you, and many more entrepreneurs and businesses. Thank you. Good night.